We will have a couple of men who will be in the Appalachian Outlaw series that it will be questionable if they were outlaws or innocent men. Evan Hobson will be the first man in this category. As we walk through the events and his trial, we will ask you, our jurors, to decide if he was truly innocent or guilty as charged. The laws of the late 1800s to early 1900s were very different concerning the crimes, and we will take a look at those laws as they stood during the time of the trial. Did Evan Thompson deserve death for the crime while others served time? We will also leave this to you to decide. Today, we're going to go back in time and find out more about Evan Hobson. But before starting, I need your help. I can drive the time machine and do the narration, but I need you to push the like, subscribe, and bell buttons to get the time machine started. This helps us out so that we can get a bigger time machine and take more people with us. And without further ado, here we go. A note about trials. We will be discussing a time in history when the Appalachian Mountains were ruled by feuds and outlaws. Back then, if a crime was committed, the accused party would confess to the crime, get time in the penitentiary to avoid going to the gallows, to go home after serving a few years. However, as we have seen time and time again, the harder that someone fought this system, the more likely it was that they would be found guilty and face the gallows. As we shall see, such was the case of Evan Hobson. So, who exactly was Evan Hobson? Evan was born in 1873 to Littleton W. and Mary Emmeline Brummett Hobson. He would have several siblings. They were Lafayette Noah, Elizabeth, John C., and Littleton Hobson. According to the Times Dispatch, Evan was 35 years old at the time of his death and had a wife and three children. However, when you do the math, he was only 29 to 30 years old at the time of his passing. A spree gone wrong. To spree an Appalachian is to drink and eat all night long. This was the plan for Ev Hobson, Bob Mullins, and Enoch Wright. On November 5th, 1902, the three young men sat around drinking their whiskey at the town of Glay Morgan near the Wise County Courthouse and soon they began to get hungry. According to the Wise County Sentinel at the time of this event, Hobson was a foreman at a construction camp located in Glay Morgan. The two men with him were men that worked under him at the construction site. According to the source, first the group went to Norton to buy whiskey then traveled over to Sayers Farm on Greasy Branch near Glen Morgan. According to the Clinch Valley News, the events unfolded in this way. Someone came up with the idea of stealing a chicken, cooking it over a campfire, and continued drinking and eating for the rest of the night. So the trio went to the home of John Sayer to steal a chicken. Again, according to the Wise County Sentinel, Hobson and one of his companions went into the dark chicken coop to catch a chicken without any light or aid. The third man stood at the door of the chicken coop, holding Hobson's revolver as a guard. While groping around in the dark, a hen squawked, alerting Sayer that something was not right. According to the Clinch Valley News, Sayer, hearing the noise, ran out and was knocked down with a rock, and then he fired in the direction that the rock came from. One of the three men fired back at Sayers, striking him in the side, killing him. Robert Mullins would admit upon his oath that Hobson fired the shot, and Mullins confessed to having thrown the rock. The Arrest The following is a loose summary taken from the book Crimes, Criminals, and Characters of the Cumberlands and South Virginia by Roy L. Sturgill, pages 5-21. through 21. Mullins, Hobson, and Wright were all arrested shortly after the shooting had taken place. They were taken to the jail in the city of Lynchburg, Virginia. Many of those who were charged with murder were taken to this jail instead of being housed in the Wise County Jail itself. It was believed that Wise County Jail did not have sufficient security to protect prisoners from mobs and escape attempts. 
on Saturday, December 27, 1902, Honorable Judge W.S. Matthews ordered that the Sheriff of Wise County, Virginia, to go to the jail to bring the three men confined there to appear to answer charges for murder. The first hearing would be set for the month of January. This order was given to the Sheriff of Wise County, who took custody of the trio to bring to the trial. The Special Grand Jury On Wednesday, January 28, 1903, Ive Hobson, Enoch Wright, and Bob Mullins appeared in court. The Commonwealth Attorney and the defendants, along with the Sheriff of Wise County, approached the bench. There may have been errors in the original indictments. The Commonwealth Attorney made a motion to drop each of these cases in favor of having a special grand jury to be impaneled. The motion was granted and ordered. The following jurors were chosen. John Adams, Jr. was the foreman. W. D. Thornton, John W. Green, Harvey Easterling, M. G. Gilly, and D. C. Ramey were chosen as jurors. After being presented the evidence and the indictment, the jurors retired and considered everything and returned after some time. A true bill was given and the three men were indicted for murder. The jurors were dismissed for the rest of the term. There were changes to the indictments, such as the name Ive Hobson was changed to E. A. Hobson. This would carry forward through the rest of the trial. Arraignment On Friday, January 30th, 1903, once again the Commonwealth Attorney, the defendants, and Wise County Sheriff all appeared before Judge Matthews. Each of the defendants were arraigned and stated that they wanted to be tried separately. E. A. Hobson and his attorney demurred the plaintiff's indictment. To demur means that the laying out of the evidence is insufficient to warrant a conviction. It can also be said that the charging document is so flawed that it cannot be used against the defendant. The court overruled this motion. E. A. Hobson, through his attorney, then gave a motion to have the plaintiff's indictment quashed, which was also overruled. Not to be deterred, E. A. Hobson, by counsel, filed a written plea to the court that the Commonwealth Attorney did not have sufficient evidence against him to charge him with murder. Judge Matthews sustained the objection to which E. A. Hobson submitted a plea of not guilty in person. The writ of Venari faces. The defendant was then told that he had the right to challenge the jury that he was going before on the charge of murder. The Wise County Sheriff then did return a writ of Venari facius and list of 16 names for a jury given to him by Judge Matthews. A writ of Venari facius is a writ or order directing the sheriff to assemble a jury. The judge then ordered other Venari facius to issue for one person to be summoned from the list to be given by Judge Matthews. The defendant, by his counsel, asked the court to quash both the list and the writ of Venari facius. The court overruled this motion. Four of the potential jurors were struck from the list by the defendant and twelve jurors were then sat. They were John F. Hartsock, Simon Flenor, Cumis Kaiser, Ed Pinnell, J. F. Blanton, J. B. Richman, J. B. Willis, Roland Gibson, H. H. Bond, George Bond, Jr., L. P. Romans, and J. O. Ryder, Wilburn Killen, Sheriff of Wise County, and C. W. Renfro, his deputy, were given their orders, which was, quote, You shall keep this jury together and not converse with them yourselves, nor permit any other person to converse or communicate with them touching this trial and cause them to appear in court tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Unquote. E. A. Hobson was then remanded and taken back to jail. January 31st, 1903, the jury came back into the courtroom, and Killen and Renfro were again sworn, using the same wording, and told to return to the court the following Monday. The Trial Beginning on Monday, February 2nd, 1903, the trial of the Commonwealth of Virginia versus E. A. Hobson began. 
Several members of the jury requested to view the site of the crime. There was no objection by the defendant, and so the first day was spent inspecting the crime scene. Other evidence was given by Wilburn Killen, Sheriff of Wise County, and C. W. Renfro, his deputy, as well as the testimony of Bob Mullins, claiming that Hobson was the one that shot Sayers. They later returned to the courtroom and was dismissed for the day. On Tuesday, February 3, 1903, after hearing arguments from both the Commonwealth attorney and the defendant, the jury returned a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Immediately, Hobson's attorney submitted a motion to set aside the verdict of the jury. Judge Matthews remanded Hobson to the jail and set a time to hear the arguments about a motion at a future date. On Wednesday, February 4, 1903, the defendant made the three arguments to set aside the jury verdict. 1. The verdict was contrary to the law and the evidence. 2. The verdict was not supported by the law and evidence. 3. That while the trial was being held, that the jurors were allowed to separate for a time, even though they were ordered to stay together. After hearing the evidence for these motions, Judge Matthews overruled these motions. The defendant was then asked why the sentence could not be passed upon his person according to the law. When no further motion was made, Judge Matthews declared E.A. Hobson to be guilty of first-degree murder and subject to hang on the gallows on Friday, May 15, 1903, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Hobson then asked for a time to apply for a writ of error before its sentence was carried out. Then Judge Matthews granted Hobson a suspension of 90 days to carry out the writ of error. During the 90-day suspension period, Hobson and his attorneys made a motion to set aside the verdict and sentence because of the newly found evidence in the case. The affidavits of C.A. Vance and O.M. Vickers were submitted to the court. Judge Matthews then overruled the admission of these affidavits into the case. Hobson, upon hearing this, then submitted to the court a bill of exceptions to be signed and sealed and made part of the court record. This was done, however, the case was not overturned. This ended the court until the next term. More information from the trial. According to the website, an innocent man is hanged in the mountains. The following is a clipping from their article. Quote, John Sayers, who recently moved to Wise County from Tennessee, ran outside when he heard the frenzied clucking from his chickens, and the shooting soon erupted. Sayers was mortally wounded. William Dotson, Commonwealth attorney, talked with the wounded man later that day, and Sayers, before he died, described Hobson as one of the culprits. During the court's proceedings, Hobson admitted that he stole a chicken, but testified that Mullins and Wright had the gun and did the shooting. Mullins and Wright accused Hobson, unquote. Governor Montague Not giving up so easily, Hobson petitioned the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia to commute his sentence. This is a direct quote from the Times-Dispatch. Quote, Governor Montague yesterday refused to commute the death sentence of E.A. Hobson to 18 years in the penitentiary. Hobson was convicted of murder at the January term, 1903, of the county court of Wise and sentenced to be hanged on May 15, 1903. The governor respited him May 11th until June the 12th. E.A. Thompson, Enoch Wright, and Robert Mullins were charged with murder of John Sayer. They were tried separately, and Hobson received the death penalty. Wright and Mullins got 18 years each in the penitentiary. Hobson was tried first, unquote. Hobson baptized. The Times-Dispatch ran this article about the baptism of Hobson. Quote, E.A. Hobson, who is to be hanged at this place next Friday, for complicity with Enoch Wright and Bob Mullins, in the murder of John Sayer, was baptized in Glade Creek yesterday by Reverend Hopkins of the Primitive Baptist Church. He professes faith in Christ and says he is confident 
of his acceptance with God. Being given an opportunity at the water's edge to speak to the people, he said, quote, I know I am looked upon by the people as a murderer, but I am an innocent man. I have never shot or hurt anybody. My life is to be taken for what someone else done, unquote. It was an affecting scene as his friends and relatives crowded around him as he came out of the water to shake his handcuffed hands and especially his aged mother threw her arms around his neck and wept out loud. Unquote. Addressing the crowd at the gallows. According to the Wise County Sentinel, at noon on the day of the execution, Hobson was allowed to address the crowd at the balcony of the Wise County Courthouse for about an hour. At some point during his speech, someone let off a shot from the revolver. Hobson addressed this by saying, quote, A gun in the hands of a fool is a dangerous thing, unquote. His speech was mainly composed of giving warning to everyone not to keep bad company and declaring that he never touched a hair on Sawyer's head. Hobson goes to the gallows. On June 12, 1903, Hobson would face his sentence given to him by Judge Matthews, which was upheld by the Court of Appeals and Governor Montague. According to the website, quote, an innocent man is hanged in the mountains, unquote. The following happened at the gallows. Quote, Hobson seemed undaunted by the happenings as he chanted with a friend, J. F. Fleming, about his impending burial. Quote, Take me to the preacher John Mullins's home after I'm dead. Unquote. Hobson told him, quote, I want to be buried close to my dad in our family graveyard. Unquote. Skate Rock is in Dickinson County. Unquote. According to the Wise County Sentinel, Sheriff Killen was a longtime neighbor and friend to Hobson and knew him as a child, holding Hobson on his knee, that he did not wish to be one to lead him to the gallows. So jailer Charlie Renfro was asked to do the duty of the job in his stead. However, Sheriff Killen did end up doing the duty of his position and pulled the lever. According to the Highland Recorder, quote, Hobson mounted the scaffold bravely. He protested his innocence to the last, insisting that the shot which killed Sayers was fired by one of his accomplices in the effort to rob Sayers' chicken roost. Unquote. According to the Clinch Valley News on June the 17th, 1903, his final resting place was carried out. As stated in the report, quote, According to the request of Hobson, he was brought to the family burial ground in Dickerson County, in the south of the Cumberland Mountains, and laid by the side of his father, who answered the summons when Hobson was a mere boy. Unquote. Surprise twist. According to our sources, the two other men that were indicted went to the state penitentiary. They each had a sentence of 18 years. Enoch Mullins was pardoned in 1910. However, he would be indicted on a second-degree murder charge and have to spend his remaining time in prison along with an additional 12 years. Robert Bob Mullins was the only one of the three men that would plead guilty to the first-degree murder charge. He would remain in prison for only six years and nine months of his term before he was also pardoned. He would not commit any more crimes from that point forward. However, the often told Appalachian tale is that upon his deathbed, Mullins would confess to being the one that sent Hobson to his gallows and being the shooter that sent Sayers to his grave. According to the Wise County Sentinel, Mullins would state that in his confession of the shooting that it, quote, was his life or mine and life is sweet, unquote. It is also said by this source that Mullins was the half-brother to the Commonwealth attorney. Whether this rumor is true or not, the death of Hobson led to the destruction of the political aspirations of the Commonwealth's attorney. Thoughts and Questions Had the judge and jury already made up its mind concerning the guilt of Hobson, and that is why they returned so quickly? 
Do you think Robert Mullins really confessed to the shooting of Sayers? Do you think that Mullins was really related to the Commonwealth attorney and that is why he did not face the gallows? It is suspicious that the Commonwealth attorney lost his political power in Wise County, Virginia shortly after the death of Hobson. These are the questions that we leave to you, our viewers, and future generations to ponder and decide upon. A special thank you. We would love to thank Vicki McPeaks Tackett for her tireless hours with me as we went back and forth about the Appalachian Outlaw series. Thank you for all the information that you gave me and sent me down a path to find all I could about each of these on our list. We truly thank you for your wisdom and your desire to want to pass along our history to the next generation so that it is never forgotten. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Outlaws. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell for notification. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries of Appalachian history.